Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Rule 451, Blowing a Transformative Age, our executive webinar with a 45-minute format in which we discuss complex topics with distinguished guests. Today's topic is uh, international arbitration in investment disputes and systemic crisis. Uh, our guests are Maria Beatrice Daly, Secretary General of the International Chambers of Commerce in Italy and Professor of International Law, and Maria Chiara Malaguti, Professor of International Law, Catholic University in Rome, and Counselor to the Legal Service of the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Thanks, Ma Maria Beatrice and Maria Chiara, for coming. Uh, let's start from the premise. Uh, financial, pandemic, and climate crisis may affect in many ways foreign investments. Uh, most of international investment agreements uh, do not provide for exemptions which allow hostages to waive their obligations <laughs> where such events occur. But few recent bilateral investment treaties emphasize that investment protection must not be pursued at the expense of other legitimate public interests. Uh, this is the conceptual basis for general treaty exemptions, mm -hmm. referred not only to taxation and regional economic integration, but also mm -hmm. to essential security, uh, prudential measures for financial services, uh, public order, protection of health, safety, and national resources. Uh, let's move on to pandemic effects. Uh, many states are taking measures to cope with the global threat rising from COVID-19. Uh, most of these measures uh, affect the interests of foreign investors. For example, uh, quarantine measures will impact foreign investors' projects. Uh, travel bans may affect obligations under bilateral investment treaties, such as non-discrimination. Uh, economic measures taken in response to the COVID-19 pandemic may force states to change national existing regulations in a way that will be detrimental to certain foreign investors. These are only examples, of course. The 2020 pandemic raises the possibility of invoking national security exemptions clauses contained in recent investment agreements. Uh, although it is too, still too early to judge, uh, recent cases law shows that a bona fide measure to counter COVID-19 may constitute a, an instance to invoke security exemptions. At the same time, current security exception clauses are not detailed enough to deal with new kinds of national emergency such as pandemic. Uh, nor have there been sufficient discussion, discussions so far to clarify and fine tune such clauses. I think that existing and future investment agreements need to revisit this provision to ensure it does not become a source of conflict or, on the other hand, a cast blanche for treaty violations. Let's take the two most typical security exemption clauses. Uh, any measure taken time of war or armed conflict or other emergency in international relations or variation in that contracting party or in international relations. Of course, uh, the two variants of this clause have a very different meaning. Uh, the first referring only to the uh, emergency in international relations, and the second also to internal emergency. Uh, considering that only few recent uh, international agreements provide for security exemption clauses, they have already been invoked in disputes procedure. Uh, a recent case is the 2019 WTO panel decision in uh, Russia traffic in transit. Uh, the panel examined Article 21 of the GATT 1994 in the context of uh, Russia's trade restrictions against Ukraine during the military conflict in 2014-2015. And the panel in that case ultimately sided with Russia by pronouncing that its measures were justified by Article 21. So my question to uh, Maria Beatrice and Maria Chiara is, uh, may a pandemic be the base of a kind of epidemic security interest? Uh, and may the current bilateral investment treaty clauses justify such an exemption? Well, um, if I may start, Fabio. Um, yes. First of all, I, I wish to, to thank you for having me on. 
And um, I, of course, I do agree on the consideration that, uh, as you said, uh, there is a need of reconsidering the, the wording of the exception clauses in order to better provide limits to its functioning in relation to states which want to enforce it. And mm. still, I'm a, I'm a bit careful uh, because I have, you know, uh, some doubts in considering that a broader content or a too detailed wording will be enough for avoiding conflicts on treaty violations. Uh, we know that, that only few investment agreements contain a security exemption clause and that the approach in, uh, in investment, international investment uh, uh, arbitration jurisprudence has been to construe um, express exceptions and defenses narrowly and uh, hi always highlighting investment protection and functions of these agreements. Moreover, um, I think that many tribunals uh, have that the requirements for justifying measures um, as necessary for essential security interests are often considered the same as the element for invoking the plea on necessity in uh, customer international law. So major differences might arise as to the substance of the exception. So what, what is the meaning of emergency? Um, in these times of pandemic, especially considering the extent of the spread of the virus, starting from China and then moving to Italy, and especially northern Italy and later all over the world, maybe emergency uh, has assumed a more precise and detectable uh, meaning. So um, it is also true that a fine tuning of the clauses is needed. But still, I think that a case-by-case -case analysis mm. seems to be inevitable, in times, also in times of pandemic. And certainly, arbitral tribunals in uh, investment arbitration are not new to public health emergencies. Uh, we might remember cases, uh, public health-related cases like tobacco mm. control, uh, toxic substances, pharmaceuticals, but still only few uh, treaties include an exception clause uh, referring to the protection uh, of human rights or public health. And mostly free trade agreements uh, provide clauses of this sort. And uh, for instance, the Canada, EU-Canada free trade agreement, which provides human uh, uh, provide for non-discriminatory regulatory measures to protect human, animal or plant life or health. Or another case um, in uh, the, the China-Australia agreement where the, the clause uh, states measure of a party that are non-discriminatory and for the legitimate public welfare objectives of public health, safety and environment. So, um, and however, even if a measure is uh, necessary for the environment, it's unlikely that a tribunal will interpret a general exception uh, excluding the requirement to pay compensation. So, um, in, uh, in, in any case, therefore, even if a measure like uh, an expropriatory measure is necessary to protect those goals, so human, animal, plant life or health, the state in any case may take the measure but still has to pay compensation. And this year pandemic, in my opinion, is clearly having for geographical extension and pervasiveness and for the economic shock it determined a stronger effect. And therefore, going back to what you said at the beginning, the exception clause stating um, uh, uh, the affecting international relations or the country, I would say international, rela international relations and the country. Uh, we know that in the in the case of uh, in case of Italy, we have this uh, maybe 60, 70 BITs in force we wonder whether the emergency measures taken by the Italian government, for example, may constitute a basis for damage claims. 
raised by foreign investors in Italy. But still, if we consider the some most recent cases, uh, I think that the link between pandemic and state measures uh, has to be demonstrated in uh, in terms of because I mean the 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 border between protection of health and economic reasons might be very tense. If we consider the very recent case of Peru, for instance, a country which has been severely hit by the virus, we had a foreign investor, uh, which is the road concessionaire for mm -hmm. the Nazca area, uh, threatening the, the government, the Peruvian government, to bring a, cla a claim over the uh, recently adopted national law, which had the effect of suspending the collection of tolls as a consequence of the economic crisis. The reason was that, well, for, for this toll law was aimed at reducing costs for commuting workers and traveling workers uh, and making so easier transport of essential good. But the motivation, in a way, it was um, not directly um, aimed at the reduction of a health risk but or health protection, but rather it was a more economic measure. Other doubts, other um, consideration I was making with regard to this problem are uh, Considering the reactions of the states adopting emergency measures due to the COVID, because they might take different forms. For instance, some of these measures were voluntary, while others were mandatory. So the question is, does it make any difference in invoking the, uh, the exception? Are voluntary emergency measures less excusable than the others, than the mandatory, uh, the com compulsory uh, measures? Mm -hmm. And again, does it make any difference the fact that some states were not prepared, not sufficiently prepared to this kind, to the uh, this severe emergency and the delay in adopting measures, emergency measures, resulted in the necessity of adopting stricter measures. Is there any responsibility for, for the state? So, you, you, we all know that the, the pandemic forced the state to adopt a set of measures and so probably it, it, it was not only one measure but a set of them a sort of package of measures uh, which were uh, at first aimed at reducing mobility the social interaction uh, in the population uh, for families for workers um, who were forced to stay at home staying at home the all business and industrial activities had to be suspended, if not characterized as a strategic by the government. And so this was the first set of uh, measures. And then we had another set of measures, which are also, uh, which might uh, raise some criticism. Uh, other measures which could easily maybe be qualified as state aids, uh, minor or major state aids, in order when the government adopted those measures in order to compensate business sector for the losses suffered and encountered mm -hmm. due to the inevitable economic crisis that was expected to follow the lockdown and all the other measures adopted uh, in the first set of measures. So. Uh, I think that we, we still have few points which have to be clarified. Yeah, thank you, Maria Beatrice. Uh, crisis may be symmetrical, but effects are not. Uh, Maria Chiara. Mm. Yeah, uh, listening also not only to what you were saying, but also what uh, Maria Beatrice was saying, 
I was reflecting, let, let's focus for one moment to, to Italy. So the Italian BIT. So not, not, not the measures that Italy, that Italy undertook, but the BIT that we have in place. We do not have any clause. I mean, if we refer to the model bit, at least, uh, that we were used to use, so both the old version of 2006 and the one that was used in 2016, in both cases, we don't have any clause uh, that covers uh, exceptions. Now, we, we all know that according to many scholars, even in the absence of those clauses, you can still have some elements to protect the action of the state. So we first thing we have to discuss is whether you really need this kind of clauses. And in the case of Italy, we are sure we don't have any. Uh, at least, I mean, I didn't make any, sorry, I didn't make any check out of each individual BIT that we have enforced. But just looking to the model bit, we don't. Uh, but there is, but I think we should be a bit more articulated in the sense that uh, if you go, for instance, even to the very old BIT that we have, so the one of 2006, you do have other provisions that can be used. For instance, if you go to expropriation and read the article in the model law that we have in expropriation, it is clear that in a situation, at least it's clear in my understanding, at least let's say we could read that article saying that when you are in situation like this one of emergency, it is not expropriation. So we don't even, it, it's really a carve out in the way you can read it. So somehow, it's not only this kind of exception that help us to solve the issue, but also possibly other, other articles that we have uh, in the BIT. Uh, however, I do agree with you that in any event, we would need some better articulation, not only under the Italian BITs, but in general, a better articulation. It is clear you were mentioning the WTO. Uh, it is clear that even uh, Article 21, the famous Article 21 of GATT, even that was not conceived to, uh, to cope with situations like this one. Okay, they speak about war, but not only, also their other emergencies, but they were never conceived as covering a situation like a pandemic with international effects. All what you have uh, on the table now is insufficient, possibly because there was not conceived to address a kind of issues like that. My only comment in general consideration uh, would, uh, would be linked to what the, uh, the WHO as declared, because as Maria Beatrice was saying, some uh, some action were uh, some action were uh, voluntary, some were mandatory. Now, really, in this specific sector, there is nothing really mandatory, one hundred percent, in terms of international law. It might be different if we look at the European Union, but if you if you make a general consideration, there was nothing that was really mandatory, but still. There was something that was consistent with what was decided at international level. So can this be a defense for a state saying that in this kind of emergency situation, the kind of measures that were adopted were consistent with what, 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 what was agreed at international level. Of course, then we have to work on the responsibility of state and possible abuse of a measure. And that is a different, a different topic. But we could elaborate on, on that starting from uh, those general principles. I know that not all scholars agree, but we could also consider the principle of precaution that we have uh, for environmental law. I know that not, there is a debate on whether this is a general principle or not. Let's leave it on a side. At least, uh, at least we can say that there is some conceptual thinking that can help us to elaborate uh, on this kind of situation without being, without getting into the real issue whether we can apply the same logic as those that apply to environmental law, you can still say that there might be some reasoning on the autonomy of a state to protect its own uh, 
country or community. And I would only make uh, one last last uh, remark uh, and I give, give the floor back to you, which is I think in our debate we should clearly distinguish the measures that were established for the pandemic, so concerning health and protection of health, and all the measures that came after as a consequence for economic situation. Because the two are linked, but are factually linked, but they might have a different uh, way, a, a different solution one way or the other. And in any event, even if we go back to the case law that we have, in one case, we have all the tobacco cases, uh, or we can try to at least to uh, link our reasoning to what was said in some of the, of the awards on the tobacco cases. On economics, we should go and see what happened for uh, for Argentina or what happened, what is now happening for uh, Greece and Cyprus. So I think somehow we should also distinguish the, the issues when we discuss this kind of topics. Thank you. Thank you also for uh, reminding us of the uh, precautionary principle and uh, the general principle. Uh, uh, let's move to a, a second point, the uh, protection of essential security interests. Uh, as you know, uh, the essential security clause is, uh, states that, more or less, a contracting party may take any measure uh, which he considers necessary for the protection of his essential security interests, is the, uh, the model. So the first question is, uh, who determines whether a particular situation warrants uh, invocation of a security exception clause in an international investment agreement. Uh, this question is usually called a self-judging issue. Uh, for example, um, in a model we can read uh, the specific interest will depend on the particular situation and perception of the state and for these reasons it is like in general to every member to define what it considers to be its essential security interest. So, uh, let's say, said judging sensu stricto is not permitted, but any uh, judging by a government invoking a national security concern uh, will carry a significant way unless the invocation is regarded as a mere excuse to circumvent an applicable treaty. A second question is, um, how far can the self-judgment of the state extend over its own security interests? Uh, let's make an example. Uh, many uh, member states of the European Union uh, have adopted on the recommendation of the European Commission uh, temporary restrictive measures for foreign investments to protect domestic companies. We call it uh, golden power or according to the case, golden share. Mm. Uh, we focus on it in a former executive webinar in a rule for 51. The formal basis of the measures is to protect critical infrastructures. The substantial basis is to prevent companies, especially listed uh, companies, from being bought during the crisis at the final price by foreign companies. And that's, um, that's reality. So my question is, uh, when, a company, when it comes to companies outside the European Union, uh, may the pandemic become a cause for exemption from the protection of foreign investments simply because the value of the companies is too short? Uh, think of example of a US bank or a US fund uh, willing to increase its stake in a European bank or uh, to get control of it. Mm -hmm. uh, I say this because the uh, European Union uh, member states' internal procedures for judging the exceptions are transparent, uh, fast, and allow the foreign investors who is not satisfied to go to a tribunal if so provided for by a bilateral mm -hmm. treaty on investments in force. So this is the, a situation that we may face in the near future. So, uh, Maria Chiara, Beatrice, do you think extra uh, EU companies can challenge the application of national and European golden power before international investment tribunals. Maria Beatrice. Maria yeah. oh. No, no, go ahead. Go, yeah. Okay. 
Well, um, first I wanted to to go back to the to your first question, which is the who. Um, who determines whether a, a, a particular situation um, is included in the security exemption clause in the investment agreement? Um, you know, even you know, going back to to our first exchange, I I, I think that the the size of the emergency in uh, in this particular situation in the a uh, COVID-19 pandemic makes things maybe m easier and more difficult at the same time because uh, it, it's so exceptional that um, this is a is a um, you know it's a public health issue uh, which has which is shared by by the, the by the the world so i think it's also Maybe the maybe easier to identify the subject who is entitled to uh, to the as you call the the self judging issues, um, and however we are in the in the big in the big area of the states right to regulate um, and. Uh, Having a convergence of problems because we have some health issues, public health issues, but at the same time we have economic challenges, and and they are all mixed together in quarantine uh, um, measures, which are uh, linked to interruption of production, to disruption of commerce, to travel restrictions, uh, limitation of movements. So we have a, a sort of very broad effect on uh, human rights, uh, economic interest, and uh, national security. So um, going back to, to the some of the definitions which have been used by arbitral tribunals, considering some huge economic crisis like in Argentina, uh, well, it's. Uh, it seems to me that the effect of the pandemic is really so vast, so big, so huge that uh, we do not have a, really a problem of self-judging, or at least uh, we have it at a lesser level because there is an objective uh, necessity. Um, still linked to this point, um, we, uh, I think it could be interesting uh, to consider that in a, we had a sort of a self-judging occurrence in Italy uh, with a direct and clear qualification of the emergency measures adopted by the government when, and especially in the measure uh, taken, in the decree taken by the president of the Council of Ministers who qualified as norme di applicazione necessaria, so overriding mandatory provisions, some measures taken in relation to different aspects of Italian law. And we know what is the meaning of these overriding mandatory provisions, especially according to the definition we have in the Rome 1 regulation. So, provisions, uh, the respect for which are, is considered crucial for, for a country for safeguarding its public interest. So probably um, the issue of uh, who is uh, maybe le less strong but still uh, probably not so difficult in these particular circumstances. Thank you, Maria Beatrice. Chiara. Uh, I, 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 again, I, I have, I mean, I, I have a general question, which is, you know, in the way you, you refer to the golden, the golden power, and is it, it, I don't think it's always an issue. I mean, sorry, your question was, can, can you challenge this kind of rules? Uh, 
under investment law. I would say in the first place, the most of cases would, in my understanding, would lead to access to market issues in the sense that you are an investor outside the country, you want to get into the country and you cannot or you are limited in your possibilities because of the kind of rules. So these are not investment protection issues. And I would agree with you that in any event, uh, the unless you have a strong argument to say that the general, the existence of uh, golden powers rules, uh, disincentivate or prohibit you to continue with the kind of investment that you had expected, but again, is a special situation. In general, that should be a market assets issue. If it's not a market asset, so if you are already an investor and you wanted to invest more in a company and you cannot do it because of the new of the new rules, you have a number of issues. The first one is, do you have any right <laughs> to get a majority stake of a company when you are a minority, uh, minority shareholder? And so might be, might be not. I mean, I, I'm just throwing a uh, possibility of discussion because it's uh, it might simply be that you have no right in fact to or you cannot prove that you had a right in that uh, in, a, in in that direction but what what i think is more relevant is probably another kind of measures that were adopted and these are in Europe, for instance, consider the measures that were adopted for all financial institutions, for all banks in particular. I mean, they could not distribute dividends. You know very well that it was suspended. It was suspended until uh, fall and then it will go most probably until spring 2021. Uh, this is a measure that the ECB recommended. If you read the communication, there is no mandatory <laughs> provision to do so. There is a recommendation, a strong recommendation. So all companies that had to apply, they all basically applied those rules, taking some responsibility because as board of directors, you then risk to be challenged by, by the shareholders. But one of the points is, in this situation where the rule is not mandatory, is it still an act of state? And I mean, we might probably say so. But the second question, if we speak of Europe, uh, this comes from the ECB, at least, at least for the systemically relevant uh, uh, companies, this comes from the ECB, even if it's applied also by the by central banks in Europe. But then you get back to what uh, Maria Beatrice was mentioning on state aids uh, or what we know on the Mikula case. So in situation where this state adopts a measure because which is consistent this time, not with international law in general, in soft law, but with a European measure, and maybe it is mandatory. It's not even, not, not simply consistent, but it's mandatory. So again, can this be a defense we are speaking of uh, European law. We know the conclusions in Mikula, so it's uh, it's indeed controversial. But you are in a situation where the the issue of whether these measures are legitimate or not under foreign investment legislation, I think, is quite difficult to establish. Of course, you should see case by case, but I would say it's uh, not so automatic. I know that it's easy to say, I mean, what I understand reading everything I could read on the debate on COVID, you keep reading that, of course, there will be an exception or there will be good reasons to uh, oppose an exception as it was in our first part of the discussion. I think that, in fact, there are also other ways, more articulated way to elaborate on possibility or lack of possibility of challenge. Because I also raise another question. I mean, uh, in uh, the kind of, it, of rules that you mentioned, what happens when the domestic investor cannot challenge the measure, but the, invest the foreign investor can? You are in a situation where uh, the foreign investor has an additional tool in respect of the domestic investor. 
And in the present situation, that might be an issue that we have to address. So my conclusion is, indeed, it is an extremely serious issue. I think we, should, we cannot solve it simply say yes or not. And I think that even if I agree with you that uh, the instruments we have uh, are not probably sophisticated enough uh, to answer exactly all of these questions, there is a good background to try to elaborate on, on this. Of course, what, what, what do I see? I see that uh, for cases, I mean, for all investment that were already made, of course, apply the existing BIT or uh, in any event investment legislation law at some point that are extremely unclear and controversial. Possibly in the future you'll see you see solution, uh, different solution that will cope with kind of issues. I guess you have also heard that someone even propose some moratoria for that. So there was some request for moratoria on any kind of uh, uh, arbitration claims on the COVID. That was, of course, uh, requested by those who are normally not in favor of protection of, uh, of investors. So it, it didn't even have so much echo, in fact. But there is, of course, a debate on how we should treat this situation in uh, this specific context. I don't think everything is uh, can be given for granted in this in this specific context. I do agree. I do agree. It depends on the case, but uh, we get uh, a chance. Uh, there are two questions coming from uh, question asked by uh, Gabriella Palmieri, Attorney General of Italy. Uh, the first one is uh, to Beatrice. Uh, what are, uh, in your opinion, the most relevant differences between uh, commercial arbitration and arbitration on investment disputes with specific reference to uh, real procedure? Well, the two different animals put together <laughs> and compared. Well, um, Usually, I mean, traditionally, uh, we consider the international commercial arbitration very different, uh, really a, another animal from investment arbitration. And especially because the, the effects or the, the outcome of investment arbitration could have a, a direct effect uh, um, extended beyond the parties because uh, because of the public interest involved. Uh, probably uh, nowadays things are, are a bit are not so different. So um, the two systems are, are not so so far away from each other in terms of procedure. And certainly this is true for the Stockholm Chamber because uh, Stockholm Chamber administ is administering both investment cases and uh, international commercial cases. Um, certainly in um, investment uh, arbitration, we have a strong public interest. That, so the business concern of the parties in commercial arbitration it has a, as another is focusing more on, uh, on other aspects of the procedure. In, well, in very general terms, we used to say that uh, one of the major issues for commercial arbitration was uh, confidentiality. But in the most recent years, we also witnessed a change in uh, a reduction in these uh, issue this need for confidentiality moving towards greater transparency not only in investment arbitration where i mean transparency is uh, uh, certainly considered and uh, as you all know a, a very big issue but also for commercial arbitration so there is a sort of uh, you know they're moving towards each other and of course, uh, um, well, the requirements for for the investment arbitration under ICSID is uh, uh, conceived under Article 25 of the ICSID rules, and then maybe also 
of course, one of the uh, also different parts of the procedure might be different as the role of experts, for, for instance. But probably the, the outcome of commercial arbitration and uh, uh, the investment arbitration is different. And in particular, considering that the differences, and this is also clear, uh, dealing with the ECT cases, uh, where there is a possibility to to start an arbitration under exit rules or ancestral or a stock on chamber well it has to be considered what happens to the award and uh, the exit uh, procedure under exit rules and what happens to the award uh, uh, under uh, the new york convention when one of the parties wants to oppose uh, to the to the award so Probably that's the, the most important difference that the users of arbitration have to consider. Yeah. Then I would also add something uh, to what we said uh, before, which is the which could be interesting. That is the um, the new role of mediation in these times of COVID because of the 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 Saudi center which tried to. Uh, maybe launched an emergency pro, uh, program which gives uh, enforceable tiles, titles to mediation settlements, which is also another measure taken during in times of COVID. And I think it could be interesting. Mm -hmm. I do agree we need an alternative resolution procedure. Uh, the second question asked by Gabriela Palmieri to Maria Chiara. Uh, as external counsel to the legal service of Ministry of Foreign Affairs, you have been assisted Italy in all the arbitration in Stockholm Chamber, in which the Italian Republic is part, and we are always grateful to you for your precious collaboration. Uh, what are uh, the differences between the defense of a private investor and the defense of a state, especially in such uh, critical situations? Thank you, Gabriella. In the first place, I'm so happy that she's connected because, uh, I mean, the Attorney General has plenty of work to do and spending time with us is really an honor. So thank you, Gabriella, wherever you are, even if we cannot see you. So thanks a lot. In terms of, uh, I mean, it's an, it's an extremely good, uh, good question because, you know, I mean, uh, it's uh, especially for someone like me coming from legal profession and starting defending Italy after having defended parties, you do see the difference. Now, of course, uh, I mean, some differences uh, are just, I mean, are marginal, let's say, and caused by the fact that you have a different kind of client, inevitably. And uh, for the, the way you deal with, I mean, a state or a government in any event is made out of several instances. And uh, this means that also the position of that client of you is, uh, it, of yours is different in the way it is, it is formed. Second, of course, uh, it has a public interest of the community that makes a difference in the way you, you defend the positions and so even if the attitude of a of a of a lawyer can be can be the same let's say in fact there is a difference but apart from what is technical i think that is a huge difference that normally people don't fully realize and that that interpretation of treaties under international law is also made out of the practice of the states so when a state has a dispute in the way it defends itself is making its position on the understanding of a clause or a treaty. Of course, I mean, this is normally not fully evaluated in the sense that, uh, I mean, you, you know, as a, as a lawyer, you can easily take one position one day and exactly the opposite next day because you are defending a diff different interest. And even the same client can take different, different approaches according to the claim, you know. Uh, this cannot be done by a state. And this is something that people normally don't fully realize. It can't be done because it is 
a part of the understanding of that state of what a specific treaty says. So this means that a state is much more consistent and coherent in its positions. And this also answers one of the issues of today is whether a state should be defended by a law firm or not. Of course, when you have your attorney general defending yourself, the attorney general, that it, its job is exactly to be able to transform these general instances of a state into, into the dispute. And then we also know that there are law firms that only defend states. And somehow this comes also from those specific specific considerations. So there is indeed a difference. I mean, there are many other, but I think this is the one of, uh, of the probably most relevant. It, it is really different. The way you, what, what you are defending is something much more articulated and uh, I mean, uh, and part uh, of the elaboration of a, of a community, which is something that you do also as a lawyer for a party. But I mean, uh, you know that what you are defending is really one very specific interest uh, in the many that, in, that you, could, uh, you could defend. I, I get the feeling that uh, we lost uh, Professor Bassano. <laughs> So we are, we yeah. are free to do whatever we want now. Say whatever we want. So I take I take the chance to answer to your question, Maria Beatrice. I mean, on mediation, in this sense, because I think that COVID, the mediation could indeed be a solution for COVID. How oh, it's coming back, because also all what's now happening on online uh, arbitration, ah. because we are doing a lot of hearings uh, uh, and everything online. I think what is coming out now, what is emerging, is a much more articulated way of settling cases. You know, uh, you know that we all have this amicable solution uh, mechanism uh, before getting into arbitration. Now you might have inside the arbitration itself uh, many more articulated ways uh, to solve the issue, and probably. Mm -hmm. Probably in a situation like COVID, which is an extremely difficult situation where we are all, all states and all parties somehow in the same situation, using this kind of alternative means instead of going, you know, to the typical the class. Fight, fighting, and yeah, that could be very good. So that could, in fact, be, you know, I mean, we discussed the old day, the old, I mean, this, this hour, we discussed... Uh, exception, non-exception, how to define clauses, but most probably we could also consider the means, the tools, not yeah, only... Exactly. People. That's why I wanted to mention, because we, we are dealing with, with, you know, with, with the arbitration, with some adjudicatory method, but still probably in this context, because of the of the size of the event, which is shared by all, probably other methods, real alternative methods could be used. Oh, welcome back. Thank you. You lost part of the, of the discussion, but we will tell you later on. <laughs> uh, thanking, I promise you. No, so, uh, th thank you. Uh, thank you, Maria Chiara and Maria Patricia for taking part uh, uh, to this to this webinar uh, for having highlighted and clarified such little aspects of international investment arbitration in, in times of crisis. Uh, thank you uh, again. Uh, the last executive webinar next Friday will focus on uh, smart contracts and artificial intelligence. Uh, Andrea Renda from Brussels, from SEPS of Brussels and the European Commission expert for digital evolution will be our guest. Uh, we will talk about uh, uh, how the European Commission is working to play a fundamental role in international trade in this uh, second digital transformation, uh, characterized by a decentralized governance and distributed cloud. Uh, again, that the European Union has not only not already lost, but has not even started. So uh, see you all uh, at the next webinar and thanks again. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Fabio. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Maria Chiara. Ciao. Thanks to Ciao. all of you. Ciao.